Well, thank you, Pastor. Open your Bibles to Psalm 52, the 52nd Psalm. I love this church. I am so glad you have been so faithful during these unusual times. I'm so glad of the way you have followed our pastor. And I appreciate your being here tonight. You dress pretty good for a night when you're staying for fireworks. Don't look too bad. I, I was in a Zoom meeting today. And they had four states. Uh, they were key states, they thought, for the election. Byron Fox and a guy named Chad Conley, who's a politician, born-again Christian, and they asked me to be a panelist in it. And I got a text from Brother Fox, and he said, uh, I'll be wearing a coat and tie. It was 2 o'clock this afternoon. And I texted back, and I said, I won't. <laughs> I said, you're lucky to be getting me off my tractor. So I... I I was in my uh, sweaty T-shirt, but we had a good Zoom meeting. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for coming. Uh, my wife, I always introduce my wife when I travel and speak. This is my wife, Chrissy, to be a very beautiful lady, about three rows from the back on your left-hand side of the center. She may slip out a little bit uh, early. After the Zoom meeting, I tried to get some work done. I needed to clean our above-ground swimming pool. And as we pulled in, I said, I'd, I'd run the hose in to fill it up a little bit. I said, I don't think I turned the hose off. So she insisted that she slip out right after the service and go turn the hose off and then we'll come back for the fireworks. You get old, things change, you know. It's just, I, I was at McDonald's the other day and I couldn't get the order right and so the young lady behind me started honking her horn. And I said, I'm going to take the high road. I went to the window. I said, ma'am, I'd like to pay for the order of the lady behind me. I paid for both orders. She gave me the receipts. I went to the next window, took both meals, and drove away. <laughs> That's not true, but it's a good story. Psalm 52. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Isn't that interesting? My attention was arrested when I read that psalm a little while ago in my regular Bible reading. I would have thought, hey, don't you boast, judgment's coming, God's going to get you. And it is, it's in the rest of the psalm. Thy tongue deviseth mischief like a sharp razor, working deceitfully. Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness, Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, O oh, thou deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of living, Selah. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at it. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. But I, am like a green olive tree in the house of God, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise thee forever, because thou hast done it. And I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. Lord, would you guide me as I preach and help me to be a help to this wonderful church that I am so honored uh, to be a member of and love so much. Thank you for Pastor. Thank you for his great leadership. I thank you for his very many kindnesses to me. And I pray that you'd continue to give him wisdom. Would you use this time to draw us closer to yourself and to help all of us who are here and all who may listen or hear by other means to understand the truth that will make us more Christ-like and give us peace in the midst of the storms of life. Bind the devil, I pray, and his demons and keep them from their intended desire to snatch away the seed of your word. And Lord, I pray we'd all decide in our own spirits right now that we'll, we'll receive the seed. We'll be good ground. And we'll be obedient to whatever you tell us. We'll thank you for working in the sermon and the invitation. I pray, Lord, that a long time from now, when we've forgotten where we heard it or who said it, this truth would resonate in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. David is running from King Saul. He has a motley crew, everybody that's in debt and everybody that's discontented and everybody that is discouraged. That was the first Baptist church, independent fundamental Baptist church. And he doesn't have any food and he stops at Nob and there is Ahimelech the priest and he says, could I have some bread? He said, well, 
What are you doing here? And David said, uh, I'm on an errand for the king. You find that in 1 Samuel chapter 21. David said unto him, Look, the king hath commanded me a business. Said unto me, let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, First Samuel 21, verse 2, and what I've commanded thee, and I've appointed my servants to such and such a place. He said, you got any food? And like said, well, I got some showbread. David said, I, I can eat that. And that wasn't wrong. It was wrong for David to lie and say that he was on an errand for the king when in fact he was running from the king. It wasn't wrong for him to eat the showbread. The Lord Jesus uses that as a positive example in the New Testament. So the priest, verse 6, gave him the hallowed bread. And then verse 7 of 1 Samuel 21, Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. And his name was Doeg, an Edomite. Pagan people, ungodly people, descendants of Esau, enemies of God and God's people. But Doeg, the Edomite, the Bible says, had risen to be the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. And we see in the beginning of our story a retaliation. Turn over to 1 Samuel 22. Verse 7, we find an angry sovereign Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? That all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, and there is none of you that is sorry for me. Watch out for leaders who want you to feel sorry for them. My policy as a pastor was if you're feeling sorry for yourself, that job's already taken care of. So I can feel sorry for somebody else who's not feeling sorry for themselves. None of you will show me in the verse 8 that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. David has escaped. Saul's trying to kill him. He's thrown a javelin at him twice to try to take his life. And David decided if he's going to die, if Saul was going to kill him, that David would rather not be there when it happened. Then answered, verse 9, Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him. And he gave him victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Saul is mad. Doeg, we'll see, is bad. Saul is going to retaliate. The king sent to call, verse 11, to Hittim, or Himelech, the priest, the son of Ahitim, and all his father's house, the priest that served Nob, and they came, all of them, to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitim. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. Saul said, Why? Have you conspired against me? Watch for people who see conspiracies everywhere. Oh, there's a conspiracy. It's largely the devil. Now, yeah, there's some people plotting and planning. But watch out. There's there no conspiracy. David's running away. Him, like, didn't know he's running away. He believed David's lie, and he gave him some bread. Why have he conspired against me, thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him? How dare you pray for this guy, that he should rise up against me to lie in wait as at this day? David wasn't lying in wait. David was running away. Paranoid people see enemies where there are none. You know the definition of paranoia. A guy goes to a football game, the team goes into the huddle, he says, they're talking about me. And Ahimelech answered the king, verse 14, and said, Who's so faithful among all thy servants is David, which is the king's son-in-law? And goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house. Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. I knew he was your son-in-law. He said he needed some bread. I gave him some bread. The king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech. Thou and all thy father's house. And the king said, 
unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay all the priests of the Lord, because their hand also was with David, and because they knew and he fled and didn't show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. There were some apprehensive subjects. They weren't eager to follow the evil instruction. Thank God for subjects who will not obey the wicked commands of evil men. All human authority is limited by God's authority. Ladies, if your husband tells you to iron his underwear, iron his underwear. Use heavy starch if you want, but iron his underwear. If he asks you to rob a bank, respectfully decline. Mississippi police officers went out and took names and license plate numbers of people who dared to go to a drive-in church. Chicago, Courtney Lewis, whom we supported when he started the Cornerstone Baptist Church, had police knock on the door and try to interrupt the service. They locked the doors as they typically did during a church service in that dangerous area. And so they didn't come in and then they took the license numbers. But in Maine, Brother Gary Wilkins, who was not allowed to meet, kept having church all during the pandemic. And he said, I know the deputy. He's there all the time, but he was never around during church. In California, the mayor of the city of Lancaster said to Brother Chapel, who is practicing civil disobedience and meeting illegally every Sunday at the Lancaster Baptist Church, he said, well, Brother Chapel, I will see to it there are no police officers on your side of town. Not on Sunday. Retaliation and angry sovereign some apprehensive subjects and then an appeasing servant. Phil X said, I saw, I, I'll tell you, you want people to tell on you, I saw David was there and him like getting bread and uh, he, he went and he gave him the sword of Goliath. And when the footman wouldn't kill the priest, the king, verse 18, said to Doeg, turn thou. And fall upon the priest, and Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest, and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. And, wasn't told to do this, but he went on back to Nob, the city of the priest, smote him with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Doeg loves killing people. He kills 85 servants of God, and then on his own, he decides to kill everybody else in the city where they live. Little children, infants that were still uh, nursing, uh, animals, everything there he kills. Retaliation. And then we see in our story remorse. One of the sons, verse 20 of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitzab, named Abiathar escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it. That day when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. David took more blame than he deserved. It was wrong to lie to Ahimelech. It wasn't wrong to eat the bread. It wasn't his fault those people got killed. It was Saul's fault. It was Doeg's fault. It wasn't David's fault. You know, good people tend to take more blame than they deserve. Bad people tend to give away the blame that belongs to them. But how would you feel if you felt you'd been responsible for the death of 85 people? priest and then all the rest of the residents of the city, the village of Nob. Many years ago, Bob Jones Jr. preached in our church. I was to take him to the airport on Monday. Got called out of the bed in the middle of the night to go to the hospital. I think, Pam, it was your dad I was going to see. And uh, Went back to bed. My wife in the morning said, honey, what time are you picking up Dr. Bob? I was kind of irritated because I was wanting to get a little bit of sleep. And I told her, and it was way past time I was supposed to leave. So I threw some clothes on. I jumped in the van. I came out of our house on Sheldon, tore down Airport Road. I got to King. I looked both ways. There was a stop sign. I didn't see any cars. And I just drove right through the stop sign at Airport and King. 
I didn't realize when I looked to the east, I was looking right into the sun. It blinded me, and I did not see there was another car coming, an older gentleman in a big old Plymouth Fury. And I got most of the way across, and he smashed into the back end of my van. He was not wrong. I was in the wrong. I, I made it across the road, but the impact pushed me into the ditch, and the back of the, of the van hit the guy wire to a telephone pole, snapped off the top of the telephone pole. The van was all smashed in. I couldn't get out. I, I climbed out the windshield because it had been smashed out. And my first thought was, man, how am I going to get Dr. Bob? And then I looked and saw that car, and I thought, dear God, don't let me have killed somebody else. David takes responsibility for killing 85 people. How would you feel? Retaliation, remorse. But the psalm we read, Psalm 52, is the psalm that the Spirit of God moves David to write about this incident. When he says, why boastest thou in mischief, uh, thyself in mischief, O mighty man? He's talking about Doeg. In fact, you look at your heading, it says to the chief musician, Maskell, the psalm of David, when Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul and said unto him, David is come to the house of Ahimelech. Now here is... What's extremely intriguing to me, and I think really, really important for us always, but particularly in these times. David rejoices in spite of his grief, in spite of his remorse. His remorse turns to rejoicing not because God is going to judge Doeg. He is. We have sermons like that. Anybody never heard the sermon Payday Someday by R.G. Lee? ought to look it up. It's all about God's going to get you someday. Jezebel takes Naboth's vineyard and kills Naboth to get it. And he tells all kinds of stories and says, payday someday. That's not what turned David from remorse to rejoicing. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. David's hope is not in the judgment of his enemy, but in God's goodness to himself. It's not that God's going to get them. It's that God is going to be good to me. Now that word goodness, I looked it up. The Hebrew word is chesed. Like we're kind of a C-H-E-S-E-D. It's used 248 times in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's correctly translated goodness, and sometimes it's correctly translated mercy, and sometimes it's correctly translated loving kindness, and sometimes it's used in God keeping a covenant with His people. It's a big word. Uh, the Lord Jesus referenced it in Matthew. He said, uh, He quoted a verse from Hosea, I will have mercy, he said, and not judgment. And then He said, You go learn what that means. Uh, I don't want your sacrifice that God said to the Jews that were disobedient in Hosea's day. I want to show you my mercy. When the Bible says, surely goodness and mercy. So follow me all the days of my life. It's that word hesed. When it said, I'll sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. It's the same word. When it says, thy loving kindness is better than life. Psalm 63, 3. It's the same word hesed. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 39, he's a God that keeps covenant. It is that word hesed. And David moves from remorse to rejoicing, not because of the thought of the judgment of his enemy, but because of the thought of the goodness of God. So let me give you some... Reminders based on this truth. Man cannot be flawless. There is no man, Solomon said, that sinneth not. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and his truth is not in us. There is nobody that is perfect. God, second reminder, can only be faithful. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6 that when God made his covenant with Abraham, he swore by himself. If you take an oath in the courthouse to tell the truth, I always say, I so affirm. Or now they'll say, do you swear or affirm? And I say, I do. If you take an oath, uh, if, you, if you become a, a, an elected official and you are sworn into office, you end the oath by saying, so help me God. 
Supposing I went to the courthouse and they said, you promised to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And I said, I do, so help me, me. I said, God did. He swore by himself. You know why I did that? Because he could swear by none greater. Uh, you know why God did that? God, uh, he keeps his side of the covenant, but he keeps Abraham's side of the covenant too. You see, Abraham didn't do all that well all the time. Oh, he was a great man, and God's covenant with him was an amazing thing. But Abraham was flawed in spite of the fact that God was faithful. Abraham lied and said that Sarah, his wife, was his sister. Abraham wanted Eliezer to be the son of promise. Abraham had a child by his wife's maid named Ishmael. Uh, but you know what God said? I keep my end of the deal whether you keep yours or not, Abraham, because the goodness of God endureth continually. Elijah does a great job against the prophets of Baal. Then he runs scared from a wicked woman named Jezebel. And he, he, he hides himself under a juniper tree. And you know what God does? God grabs him by the scruff of the neck and says, you good for nothing, lazy bum. I've taken care of you. I've done all these things for you. You get back. No, he doesn't. God gives him some food and God gives him some rest. And then God asks him what he's doing here. And then God gives him a new commission. You see, Elijah didn't always do right. But the goodness of God endureth continually. Peter denied the Lord three times after being warned that he was going to do it. He said, oh, no, I'll never deny you. If everybody else denies you, I won't deny you. And yet we find the Lord Jesus after his resurrection saying, I want you to go tell my disciples and Peter. Peter doesn't think he's a disciple. Peter thinks he's out of it now. Peter is going back to fishing, but Jesus includes him individually by name. And then he says, Peter, I want you to go back and feed my sheep. Peter is a failure and a mess up. But say it with me, the goodness of God endureth continually. Yeah, I've got a lot of problems, but the say it, the goodness of God endureth continually. David runs away from Saul and to find some, some help and support, he joins forces with the Philistines. I hope no matter how bad it gets, you never hook up with the enemies of God. And he tells Achish that he's killing the Jews. He's not. He's killing common enemies of the Philistines and Israel, but he's killing the women. He doesn't leave anybody alive. He says, lest anybody should tell on me. The Philistines decide they're going to band together several Philistine kings and fight against the nation of Israel. And Achish says, oh, David, come on. You're going to be with me. You've been killing all these Jews. I'll let you kill some with us in this big battle. And David says, oh, one, one wonderful. Now his goose is cooked. Now he's got to put up or shut up and be cut off. But you know what happens? The Philistine kings say, we're not taking David with us. Remember they sang that song, Saul has slain his thousands and David is tens of thousands. They're talking about us when they sang that song. And David got to play the wounded, misjudged and maligned individual and God kept him. David could have never been the king of the nation of Israel. He'd gone after the nation of Israel and attacked them with some Philistine kings. David messed up. David didn't trust God. David was way out of line. But the goodness of God endureth continually. Israel makes a covenant with the Gibeonites. God said, don't make any covenant with the people of the land. The Gibeonites come and say, make a deal with us. Uh, we can't do it. You might be from close. I know we're from far away. Look, at our bread is moldy. We took it fresh out of the oven when we started the journey. Our shoes are worn out. Our water skins are all cracked. And the Bible says this, that they asked not counsel of the Lord. Okay, we'll make a deal with you. And right after that, they found out the Gibeonites are right close by and they were never supposed to make an agreement with them. And right after that, a bunch of kings get together and come against the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites say, help, you got to help us. You made a deal with us. I, if I were God, I'd have said, okay, you're on your own, guys. But God doesn't do that. God, I preached a sermon that, on that subject years ago. And one of my points was God helps stupid people anyway. Praise God. I qualify. Some of y'all do too, whether you want to admit it or not. And God gives Israel a victory over that confederation of kings, not because Israel did right, not because Israel was faithful, not because Israel kept covenant, but because the goodness of God endureth continually. David Livingston's favorite verses were Matthew 28, 19, and 20. He particularly liked the part that said, I... And with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And whenever he came a time in his very 
dangerous and adventurous exploration of the nation of Africa, of the continent of Africa. Whenever he's in real trouble, he'd write those verses anew in his journal. And then after he wrote them, he would write this little appendage. It is the word of a gentleman of the strictest and most sacred honor. And that's the end of it. Hey, I got news for you. Say it. The goodness of God endureth continually. And that's the end of it. Man cannot be flawless. God can only be faithful. The reminder is this. We must not be fearful. I started to write when I was writing this sermon a little bit ago, we should not be fearful. No, we may not. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We don't have to worry. It's the goodness of God that took a shepherd thought unworthy by his own family to be the next king of Israel and put him on the throne. It's the goodness of God that took the 11th son of Jacob from the pasture to the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison. By the way, in the prison, the Bible says Joseph learned the mercy of God. Genesis chapter 39. And that is the same word has said, you know what Joseph found? Found out that as bad as jail was, it wasn't as bad as he deserved. And as bad as jail was, he still had God's presence. He still had God's love. He still had God's protection. He still enjoyed the goodness of God. It took him from the prison and took it, put him on the throne in the palace. It was the goodness of God that sent ravens to feed Elijah by the brook and gave Samson water from the jawbone of a donkey and took a widow woman who was about to sell her sons to pay her debts and gave her a cruise and some vessels of oil that all filled up from one little vessel of oil and said, pay the debts and keep the oil and sell the rest and live on. And he took her from bankruptcy and bondage and put her in the oil business. It was the goodness of God that delivered 1.2 million Jews out of bondage in Egypt and in spite of their murmuring and in spite of their complaining and in spite of their disobedience and in spite of their total lack of faith fed them for 40 years and put them in the promised land just like he said if we deny him he abideth faithful he cannot deny himself Hey, he swear by himself, uh, your love of God, your protection from God, your, your commitment, your, your, your involvement and inclusion in the family of God don't have a thing to do with you. They got everything to do with the goodness of God. It's the word of a gentleman of the strictest and most sacred honor. And that's the end of it. He cannot deny himself. You say, but I've really messed up. Maybe lots of us have. But the goodness, say it, the goodness of God endureth continually. You say, but I'm under lots of attack. You may be. But the goodness of God endureth continually. You say, I'm tired of all this corona confusion. I don't blame you. But remember, the goodness of God endureth continually. You say, they're unfair to me at work. They probably are. But the goodness of God endureth continually. You say, I keep doing the same dumb thing over and over again. Maybe I've done that. But the goodness of God endureth continually. My family is a mess. Maybe it is, but the goodness of God endureth continually. I don't know if my wayward children will ever come back. I don't know either, but the goodness of God endureth continually. My, my financial situation looks like it will never be resolved. That may be, but the goodness of God endureth continually. Well, I've had more chances than I could possibly deserve. We all have, but the goodness of God endureth continually. I'm glad I don't have to worry about whether God gets my enemies. I'm just glad He promised to be good to me. God's goodness is greater than your addiction, your adversaries, uh, or your anxiety. God's goodness is greater than all your burdens, your battles, and your bondage. God's goodness is bigger than your concerns and your confusion and your calamities. God's goodness is greater than your difficulties, your depression, your disappointments. God's goodness is bigger than your excesses and greater than your enemies and larger than what happens in the 2020 elections, God's goodness is bigger than your failure, your faithlessness, or your fears. The goodness of God can turn you from famine to feasting. It can turn sorrow into joy. It can give you beauty for ashes. The goodness of God endureth continually. 
They can burn down our cities, but they can't turn back the goodness of God. They can quarantine us, but they cannot contain the goodness of God. They can legislate against believers. We've had three bad decisions from the Supreme Court in the last little bit. But our hope is not in the Supreme Court. Our hope is in Jehovah God. And the goodness of God endureth continually. They uh, can key your car and kill your cat and call you crazy, but they cannot stop the goodness of God. So I'm just really bothered by my work. Watch the news. Well, turn it off. Open your Bible and read about the goodness of God. You say, well, I don't know what the future holds, neither do I. But I know the goodness of God endures continually. But we've never faced anything like this before. Maybe not, but it's no surprise to God. God is not sitting up in heaven saying, oh my, what am I going to do? His commitment, His covenant, His promise to His people is unchangeable because He swear by Himself and His goodness endures continually. And I want you to understand what happens in our world has not one thing to do with our lives as servants of God. Our job is the same. Doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's in the, the Capitol, doesn't matter who's in the State House, doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says, doesn't matter what our neighbors do, doesn't matter what our boss does, doesn't matter what our family says, what our job is to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. You take Paul and he runs around starting churches and then you put him in jail and he's chained to the Praetorian Guard in eight hour shifts and he wins them to Christ and he says at the end of the book of Philippians, all the saints salute you, chiefly those that are of Caesar's house. You know what he did? He just kept winning people to Christ in jail and he started a church from the jail cell in the city of Rome. His job didn't change. Your job doesn't change because our God doesn't change. Isaiah 26.3 says, That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. You know we're unhappy? Because look at all that stuff instead of the goodness of God. You know, uh, uh, Dr. House said some years ago, I've never gotten, he said, here's why you get frustrated. He said, you decide what other people ought to do. Have you ever done that? Well, I think they should. Well, if I was in charge, I would. Well, they ought to. So you figure out what other people ought to do. I don't know, but when I was a boy, my mother would say, you take care of Renee, we'll let you have a full-time job. usually said that when I was talking about my sisters <laughs> who were far more worthy of judgment than I was in my opinion then we get upset because they don't do the stuff we decided they ought to do which was never any of our business don't focus on all that stuff get your eyes off the problem get your eyes on the Lord pay attention to the goodness of God Bonnie Riles here tonight, God bless her. She said I could tell you this. A lot of been praying for her. She called me tonight. She said, uh, my grandson stabbed my son and then went out in the front yard and took his own life. And my son's in the hospital in critical condition. And she said in that conversation, Pastor, I'm not mad at God. I love God. Wow. I called her to see how things were going and <clears throat> they thought there might be internal bleeding. I think now there may be another issue they're checking on. Still her son's in critical condition. And she said, I woke up this morning with such peace and such comfort. <laughs> because of her circumstances? Because of a good report from the doctor? Because the goodness of God endureth continually. Amen. Say it with me. The goodness of God endureth continually. Lord, thank you. Our hope, our joy, our ability to go from terrible remorse and regret to great rejoicing is not in our circumstances. It's not in what you do to those who may oppose us or oppose you. It's in the fact that you're a good God, a loving God, a kind God, a merciful God, a covenant-keeping God. So help us to be grateful and to rejoice no matter what goes on around us because the goodness of God endureth continually. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.
simple invitation. Has the Spirit of God spoken to your heart? That unrest and confusion and unsettledness and unhappiness. A lot of terrible things going on in our world. A lot of terrible things. Not from one segment of society, not from one side of the political spectrum. Just a lot of terrible things. But the goodness of God endureth continually. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed in thee, because he trusteth in thee. So who says, Brother well, that I need to obey this principle from God's word and apply it in my life? God's dealt with me about it. Pray with me. If you say that, hold your hand up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Father, help us to act in obedience. Thank you for many who lifted a hand. Help them all and others to bend a knee. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Spirit of God spoken to your heart. The altar's open. I invite you to come and find a place to talk to God and do business with Him.